Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mission San Juan Capistrano, Jewel of the California Missions. My name is Michelle Lawrence Adams, and I'm so happy to have you join us from the internet world, the Zoom world out there, Facebook. Welcome. Welcome to our mission. Um, I'm going to put a mask on if people get too close, but for the purpose of today, I thought what I would do is give you a little insight, kind of perspective of the mission where, from wherever you are. So sit back, get comfortable, and join me as we take a look at the Orange County's only mission. We're at the entrance off of Ortega Highway right now, and we're in the citrus grove, and it is just beautiful. It smells like the beautiful flowers of the citrus blooms. And when you come into the mission, you're greeted by the Camino Real Bell here. Uh, to my left, maybe your right, which rises to greet each guest as a reminder of the Camino Real Bell, the Camino Real Trail, which Father Sarah and the Padres traveled. So here at Mission San Juan Capistrano, we were founded in 1776. You might already know that. It's the same year as our country's founding. But what's interesting about our mission is because of our location, one hour from Los Angeles, one hour from San Diego, is that we're in the middle, a great stopping point. And so people for decades and generations have been coming to this mission on their way from one place to the other. And coincidentally, because of those little birds of ours, our, our friends, the swallows, uh, we become known as a destination for vibrant history and storytelling. So follow me as I share with you some things that we've done. When you come into the front courtyard on the St. Joseph's Day, one of the things that we don't normally have is a St. Joseph's table, and that's right behind me today. And the St. Joseph's table is a tradition in Italy and the Catholic faith of raising food or giving food for the poor and the hungry in our community. Normally we have a food drive. Today we were just raising a little bit of dollars to help our local food pantry. And so in the year of St. Joseph, which in the Catholic Church is this year, uh, we wanted to make sure that we had a special table doing something good in his name. As we go over here to the front courtyard, which is one of my favorite places, I'm surrounded by the soldiers' barracks to one side, to an elderberry tree behind me, which the Native American and indigenous people use for resources, and then the Sala building. And the Sala building is the 18th century. But right next to the Sala on the exterior, is one of the biggest American flags out there right here in San Juan Capistrano. The Daughters of the American Revolution helped to give us funds for preservation. We said we wanted to hang an American flag and put it on the parapet of this 18th century building, but we didn't have the money to do it. And so they helped with a donation to help us to construct a special attachment. Let's go take a look at our American flag. We're gonna walk through the gardens in the front courtyard. And you're gonna see these beautiful copies. And go a little faster. And as we walk through the gardens to the bell wall, to the American flag, I want you to know how grateful I am that you joined us today because it's been a hard year. I'm sure for a lot of you as well out there, COVID has brought about a lot of changes to our lives, namely our masks, but also to our ability to be in places like the mission. Mission Selling Capistrano has opened its doors just in time for St. Joseph's Day which we're really happy about because last year we had to close for the first time in a hundred years and not ring the bells. Follow me as we go to the American flag. We're walking through a beautiful oak tree that's about 17 years old, but he looks like he's been here for hundreds of years. He loves his location. And when you come into the mission now through the front courtyard, he used to be able to see the bell wall, but our tree is just loving this sunny location and he's just growing faster than we would ever have imagined. We planted him just uh, 17 years ago. But if you come be beyond the acorn or beyond the oak tree, you'll see behind me the California poppies, which is a state flower, and the poppies of pops. They were planted by our garden angels that are our volunteers that take care of the gardens. And O'Connell Landscape Maintenance, our maintenance firm that also takes care of the gardens. And you'll see just how stunning it is. And I would tell you this, eight weeks ago, they weren't like this. And at the mission in San Juan, our mission is always in blooming and change. And it's so interesting because right now you don't really see the roses, but they're coming. They'll be blooming very soon. Right now you can see the poppies and you can see the geranium. So behind me is the American flag. And we really take a great amount of honor and pride in being a place where many, many men military men and women and their families come to visit because coincidentally having our founding period be in 1776 and being close to Camp Pendleton and what used to be the Altoro Marine Base, 
is that we are a place of inspiration and people like to come here whether they're Catholic or not, to make a stop, to say a prayer, to enjoy the gardens. And many times we have people that are going off to serve our country and this will be a place that they come. We also have a lot of parents come into our store and they'll buy the little medals for their loved one to wear while they're in service. So we take great pride in having an American tradition here. And for our American flag, which is up today for St. Joseph's Day, is something we really feel good about having. Throughout the gardens right now, we have butterflies, hummingbirds, lizard sunbathing. It's pretty amazing how much actual nature life is at the historic mission. Many times after hours when the gates are closed, there's a skunk that'll go by me or I'll see a little possum. But the mission is actually very vibrant and full of life from the koi ponds all the way to the swallows. Follow me as we get to the bell over here. One of the highlights of any visit to this mission is to see the iconic bell wall. And the bell is wall has its own interesting story. It sits right by the American flag. So you see the four bells behind me? Well, the two little ones are original to this mission. And the two big ones behind me are copies or recasts of original ones. Let me tell you the story about how the bell wall came about as a highlight. When the mission was built, the Greystone Church was built, and it was a consecrated Catholic church where mass was celebrated. And that church was right here, it's really big, maybe 70 feet tall in the bell tower. And when the earthquake happened in 1812 on December 8th, Mass and Immaculate Conception, the building fell down and the bell tower fell down, and the bells fell down, and it killed 40 people attending Mass that day. It's the largest tragedy in Orange County history. And sadly, those people that actually built the mission perished in the middle of their own efforts. And so the bells, which actually brought people together in Mass and worship, the regularity of life, not like our outlook phones or schedules we have today, the bells were reconstructed to be put over in this bell wall, Campanario, and all of the historic bells were there. But in the late 90s, uh, two of the largest bells had cracks in them and they were removed and copies were made and involved. So you have the two new ones and then you have the two original. When I came to work here in 03, I found the original ones with the cracks so and we had a conservator come out to repair them back in the original bell tower. So when you come to the mission, you have to realize that history is always changing. There's always something new to learn. It's not a straight and even shot. Follow me while I show you something else. Today was a really cool day because I think it's like my 30th St. Joseph's Day, my 18th one here at the mission, if I had had one last year, I guess. And St. Joseph's Day is about celebrating the return of the swallows in the Catholic Church, the St. Joseph's Feast Day. If you don't know how it all started, it all started in Beau Sullivan in 1910, 1933. He was the pastor here, and his birthday was on March 19th, coincidentally. Well, while he was here, he built the gatehouse and charged admission so he could raise money to preserve the mission. And he built the school, which is now the Mission Basilica School. It used to be the Mission Parish School. And he started the tradition of welcoming back the swallows because he noticed on his birthday every year with St. Joseph's Day, but that the birds would always seem to come back around that time. So he started the celebration and that included a procession for the school children and a celebration. Well, Leon Rene, composer, you might know the song Rock and Robin. He wrote the song when the swallows came back to Capistrano and that was in the thirties. And it hit the rock charts or the top charts, the top of the charts. And a whole generation of Americans listening by radio, which now we're doing podcasts, but listening by radio to hear about this mission in California where the swallows came back. And people like my great grandma and grandma said, when I get out of Nebraska, I'm gonna go visit that mission. And so we had a whole generation of World War II veterans and Vietnam War veterans that heard about this mission because of that song. So we owe Leon Rene a debt of gratitude, not only for being a composer, but for being a preservationist because he put this mission on the map and people all of a sudden were aware of it. And in a way, regardless of your faith tradition, when we celebrate the contributions of our indigenous people, and we celebrate the contributions of Father Sarah, we realize that all of this comes together magically to create this oasis of history and heritage. Well, the swallow celebration grew and grew and grew and the return of the swallows the number of swallows got bigger and bigger and bigger. People that have come here in the 60s and 70s and 80s said they remember seeing hordes of swallows. But when the preservation of the ruins happened, the nests were removed. And so when the nests were removed, when the swallows came to come back to this mission, their nests were no longer here. So they went over to the creek bed 
which is just on the other side of the train track here. And they've been building all their nests in the Capistrano Valley by the train tracks. And so we celebrate their arrival and the return of the swallows. We celebrate the renewal, the time of spring and the abundant flowers. But we also say that we're grateful for the swallows and Leon Renee because our little avian ambassadors did us a great debt of, of, they helped us a great amount by putting us out there as an embodiment of the California mission system. Now, it's been a challenging year. I would be less in Canada if I said it was easy. We had to shut our doors and lay off our staff, not once but twice. We had to furlough people and it was a tough time to be furloughed and lose your medical benefits. And we're still trying to get out of that. But the future is really bright because the community really helped us out a lot because they appreciated the value of the grounds and the meaning and the opportunity to teach, inspire, and educate. The traditions of ringing the bells and celebrating the swallows return is just one thing that we do among many that help to create a sense of special here. And one of the things that we aim to aspire here that I encourage you to come visit is to see what we're doing to celebrate our indigenous people. So behind me is a new monument. You'll see it in bronze. And it's a listing of all of the indigenous people that perished in that December 8th earthquake in 1812. And it recognizes their indigenous name and their baptized Catholic name. And in doing that, we celebrate every December 8th, not only the Mass of the Immaculate Conception on site, but we remember. And we have a day of remembrance that day where we toll the bells, working with uh, members of our local tribe to read each of the names of both Catholic as well as indigenous and to celebrate their rich contributions. And I think it's really important as this mission goes forward that we continue to be inclusive and expand our reach. And that's what we're doing today with the virtual tour. By you tuning in, um, I may not even know you, but now I get to know you. You get to know a little bit about the mission and perhaps that'll pique your interest to come back. Let's go take a look at the ruins of the Great Stone Church. I'm gonna put my mask on as we walk over there. So follow me. Whenever I give a tour of the mission as director, I always ask for people to join me in a moment of silence or pause or reflection, because what we're looking at is no longer a church. It was a really big church when it was built from 1796 to 1806. And it was a really big church when it was used as a church from 1806 to 1812. But today it's ruins. And the ruins are a testament to tragedy and the human spirit. To think that every stone that was placed on the wall was placed by a baptized Catholic working under direction from someone whose language they didn't speak, all for the embodiment of bringing Christianity to the West Coast here in a country that wasn't the United States. It's pretty mind blowing when you think about all that was accomplished. And they called this building or these ruins the American Acropolis. And today it stands as a reflection of that which comes before us, deserves reverence, respect, as we go forward to grow and evolve as a historic landmark. Behind me, you see what could be considered a retablo or behind the altar, um, it's niches where statues would have been or candles. But today you don't see the white plaster. Behind me, you see the brick that's exposed. And behind me, you see a railing and that's not a historic railing. We put that railing in in about 2004, 2005. And the railing is to keep you from going into that space because those steps are original and they're very fragile. And what you will see is like this dirt that sits on top of the top step. It looks like kitty litter, decomposed granite. And underneath it is a black little film or tarp, almost looks like a rug. And it sits on top of original tiles that were made here, both made, mixed, and, and baked on this property. And so there's diamond tiles up there. They're diamond shaped. If you were to come and visit the basilica, just north outside of the historic mission gate, you would see that they have uh, flooring that looks like diamonds as well. That's because the Basilica got its inspiration from the Great Stone Church ruins. But what you might not know is the transept, and if you think of the, of the ruins as a letter T, if you are a bird flying over and you look down, it looks like a giant cross. The transept is the cross part that goes left to right, and underneath that are all those special tiles. We had to cover them with a little fabric and also the decomposed granite to allow the water to Away from them and also to prevent people from breaking them as they walk. So I think the ruins are stunning. And what's interesting.
interesting if you follow me for just a moment. There's one room that survived the earthquake of 1812, and that's the vestry room or the sacristy. And if you're not Catholic, you may not know what that room is for, so I'm going to explain it. It's where the priest gets ready for the celebration of Mass. And so it's a room where they're putting the vestments on, getting everything together for the Mass celebration. Well, you'll see that there's like a brick wall in it with some railroad ties. And guess what? Those railroad ties are from the, when, the rain, when the train track came through here in the late 1800s. Those are remnant materials. And when people, the early preservationists here in 1910, Landmarks Club and Father of Sullivan tried to save the mission from falling down, they put a little fence around, charged admission, and started raising money for preservation. They looked to use materials to help keep the mission standing, and they used remnant railroad ties from the new train line that came through this area north south orientation. So you'll see that, and that's pretty cool. What we found in our conservation work over the last 17 years is that all the doors from the 1910 to 1933 period are redwood and made in the same style. And there are certain rooms on the mission ground that we're able to tell that are from that period. So we know that they came about in that time frame. Now, you kind of maybe don't know that old places need a lot of care and maintenance. It's really expensive. Just like owning a house, only this is a house that belongs to the people. And we don't get any money from the church or from the state. So we have to raise our own money. We charge admission. We have a membership program. And so when the pandemic happened, we didn't have anybody coming here. No students. We see about 58,000 fourth graders. We didn't have any concerts. We didn't have any events. So it was really devastating for the historic mission. Everything we ever did was about bringing people here and sharing the good news. So the maintenance of the mission and protecting it from falling over was a little bit in jeopardy. But among the things I'm proud of that I love so much is this triple arch here. That, can you imagine trying to make that with the materials of 250 years ago? The very top of the ruin has a lead cap that's bendable. And the lead cap, sometimes when the wind comes up, they have to push it back down. But it prevents the water from running off and from the animals from making a little nest. And that's just like a little protective device. You can see that there's actually a crypt in the ruins. And yes, someone was once buried there. It's empty right now. But it's pretty spectacular that there's actually a crypt here on the grounds. So let's walk and take a look at these bells that I wanted to show you. It is St. Joseph's Day today at the mission, so there's a lot of people. Even though most of our event is virtual, we were able to ring the bells at the mission four times, 9, 10, 11, and 12, with our bell ringers, and that was really fun. But our event was very much scaled down. And because it was scaled down, we wanted everyone to know that we're going to bring back a big celebration next year when it's safer to do so. So let's keep going. And what you're looking at right now is the east side of the mission property. And we're going to go in here. This is the footprint of the original bell tower of the mission. So the bell tower, I told you, fell down, and the bells had to get moved through the Campanario or the bell wall. Well, it might have stood as high as 70 feet. They didn't have architectural plans to leave behind for us. But we can do some estimation based upon the foundation width and proportion scale. One of our records that we use, believe it or not, to know about how old things are, if you look at old paintings from the 20th century and the turn of the century, because of Laguna Beach and we have our artist colony there, many artists would come here at the beginning of the 20th century and paint because they could use an outdoor paint studio. The outdoor paint meant they could travel. They didn't have to do their painting in the studio. So they could come outside in plain air. The plain air art tradition was about capturing landscape and architecture. And so those paintings that were donated to the mission in the early 20th century became part of our art collection. So we have our religious art, and that makes sense, right? The historic religious art from the Catholic Church. But then we, as a mission, have all these plain air paintings out of Laguna Beach. And so that's something that's different about our mission. Um, other missions don't have that kind of collection. So when we want to do some preservation investigation, we'll look at those old paintings and say, well, what does the tile roof look like? How did Charles Percy Austin paint that? Oh my goodness, that tree was a baby. Now it's really big. So we know that it went in around the early 1900s. Another resource for us as preservationists is the something called the Amer Historic American Building Survey Drawings, which were put together as a result of Roosevelt's administration when he took mostly men off the bread lines that were engineers and had them go about the United States and draw up the plans as they saw the as built historic landmarks. And so in the 1930s, engineers drew what they saw here on the plan. 
plans and when we want to reference what is it what does a door look like or how's that arch look go to the drawings a lot of times things look exactly the same once in a while something's missing i know when we look over and missing some doors in the sala but we looked at the drawings and we saw that there had been doors in the 1930s so we made new doors that match those standards so this is these are the bells and i'm gonna let you hear them so and then you know why we don't ring them so this is the first one listen Okay, right? Now listen to this one. It's not great. That's because there's a crack in it. Here's the other one. Did you hear that? So we can't ring the bells melodiously because they have a crack. And the crack, I'm trying to find where it is. Let's see. If you go under here, you can see it. Here it is. There's the crack here on this one. And so the crack was infilled. And we clean it with wax. So every year we do a wax coat treatment. Our archivist or museum registrar comes out, you know, surfboards, they have wax so they don't fall off. We pretty much use the same kind of thing. We take wax, we rub the bells, and these bells are over 250 years old. And then the water just kind of sheets off easier. It kind of protects it like, like sunscreen, if you will. And they're holding up really well. But these bells are the original ones, and they were in the bell tower where we're standing now, the footprint at least. And then they were in the Campanario for 150 years or so. And now they made their home, homecoming coming back here. So I like to think of the bells coming home as the way I like to think of you, our guests, our students, and the people that have a health issue and they want to go to St. Peregrine's Chapel or some issue of the heart. I like to think that you're coming home when you come to see this mission, regardless of your faith tradition. You can come here and feel something aspirational or inspirational. And the bells could be part of that because we ring them every day now. We ring them at nine o'clock. We open our gates at nine. So we run and we go open the gates and then the guests come in that are a few here. And then we toll the bells seven times. And I probably wonder why do you told them seven times? Well, we told them seven of nine times because this is the seventh of nine missions founded by St. Sarah. And we honor and respect his contributions to the California statehood and all the things that his life left for us to appreciate the wine of California, the great mission towns, the beauty of the Catholic Church, and for Christians and Catholics, the beauty of their faith. And so the bells are very much a lyrical part or a soundtrack part of that. So we had to build a system to hold these bells in place. They're super heavy. We had to use a crane to lift them and it has to be reversible. As a preservationist, we don't want to tell a false story. So we don't want you to think Father Sarah built this structure. You can tell it's modern. We want to make sure everything we do is reversible. So if we were treating the bells a certain way and we need to do something different, we should be able to reverse our treatment. And we also want to make sure that we respect the intention of the original artists. So document and record every treatment that we do. So this is a structure that's a modern day structure that sits atop the foundation, not kind of sitting the foundation here of this very important sacred site. And it is reversible. If we need to change this, we can do that. So that's the part that's so cool. In our store, you see these crosses here? We actually have an impression. We made little crosses out of our ceramic studio. It takes more time. We don't make a whole lot of money doing it. But we sell them for like, I think less than $20. And it's this exact cross that we hand make. It's just to give you a little something from the mission that's actually mission inspired. We also have a little silver necklace. And I think it too is $20 that has a cross just like this. I think it's pretty cool if you wanted to wear a bit of the mission on you. So follow me. Questions? We have a question. Um, my wonderful assistant, Alexander, because I can't fill in talk at the same time, is going to read the question to me. So where were the bells made? Well, most likely in Spain. They wouldn't have been forged here. Um, the interesting thing about our art artifacts, we always want to know where did these things come from? Let me just give you a little perspective on this. I don't think that the Catholic Church, when they were coming here to what is now California, knew they were going to be historically significant. And they're in the business of bringing the word of God and teaching the faith and in the 20th century, educating people. And all of a sudden the world starts to change and places start becoming historically significant. And when you look at our democratic founding as a country on the East Coast, most of those buildings that were used for city hall or for governing were also churches, multi-purpose buildings. And so the idea of preservation really is stronger. It was a little ahead of California. California is newer. And in California following suit, it too started in the 20th century to take stock and its leaders like Charles Lummis 
uh, he was a librarian for the city of LA and a writer and a raconteur and a traveler and a heritage uh, journalist. And he called for the preservation of the California missions. And that really happened around 1910 when that impetus. So I would say from 1910 to today, we're in the preservation period, but the preservation period is also an opportunity to expand our reach and be more inclusive and make sure our history tells more stories about the indigenous people and celebrates it and is, is interpreted in many different mediums. So for instance, this virtual tour allows us to be more accessible to you at home, but maybe you would never come here. Uh, maybe you live far away or you, you can't afford it, or maybe it's just difficult, uh, it's cold weather or you're not mobile. So there's new accessibility for our mission. Any other questions, Alexander? How big was the Greystone Church when it was standing? Well, there are no plans. So the estimates are that the bell tower was 70 feet. So proportionately, it was probably 50 feet to 35 feet. You have to realize that a 25 foot, or so it's about 10 to 15 feet per story. So if you're looking at a two story building, it's usually 25 to 30 feet. So this would have been a very grand building because it would only have been one story. There was no fire loft in this particular building, as far as we know. Are the records that we have are some early um, paintings and sketches, but it's well after the mission founding period. And the mission founding period for this mission is like 1776 to about 1830s, when the mission started to come into decline and isolation and being sold off. So we don't really know. And I have so many questions for the people that came before me to ask them, how did you get the bells here? How did you get the rocks here? I mean, we can guesstimate that they took these stones from the riverbed and that the Native American people brought them over and they mixed their mortars here, but we can't be sure exactly what it felt like, but it had to be a tremendous amount of human labor. Any other questions? Okay, I think I just locked Alexander in. I need to open this up. So I wanna show you a new little space of the mission that I think is pretty cool. If you look around, you'll see the gardens are just blooming like crazy and the roses aren't even in bloom yet. So if you can plan to visit between now and the rest of summer, it's going to be stunning. We're going to go a little faster. It's okay. I don't mind walking a little fast. We have this little model here that you can make a plan to see. It gives you an idea of what the church could have looked like. This is based upon our records. And you can see it's shaped like a cross. So if you're a bird flying over, you'll see that there's a big cross. One year, a few years ago, we did Hands Look Around the Mission event, and we had the community join us, and we tried to hold hands all around the mission, and we took a drone picture of it. And it was really, really cool because it was a bunch of people holding hands regardless of where they came from or their background, all holding hands around a cross, and it had a great community meeting. Okay, I've just given you a couple of highlights of the mission. We're going to come this way, get you out of the pathway. Let me just implore you to put the mission on your bucket list of things to visit, places to see. We have a great little town here. One of the things I love most about the mission of Sarah Chapel is California's most historically significant chapel. And it's the chapel where Father Sarah or Saint Sarah celebrated mass. It's the only one still standing that isn't pretty much intact. Now our Sarah Chapel did go through a room addition process in the 1920s uh, to expand, to allow for an apartment to be built for Father O'Sullivan in the back of it and have a space, a sacristy or vestry room. But the Sarah Chapel is absolutely stunning. We recently, 10 years ago, raised 1.7 million to conserve the Sarah Chapel and to bring the Stations of the Cross to glory, to repair the retablo, which is a gilded altarpiece. And we found, just about six years ago, we found a hidden painting for 40 years it's Station 12, and if you're not Catholic, I'll just say this real quick. In the Catholic churches, there's always a collection of paintings called Stations of the Cross paintings, and it's the journey of Jesus to the crucifixion. And Station 12 is the big crucifixion painting here that doesn't really match the set that we have because we think that that painting went with the, the set that was in the ruins and they're in the church of the Graystone Church, and it somehow survived the earthquake of 1812. But that painting got lost for 40 years and it was covered by another painting where someone had done a replica of it. And it was a modern replica. But everybody that lived here thought that that was the historic painting. And then when we found it, we had it conserved and some very good friends helped to pay for that. 
and we brought it back and it's an incredible story. So if you take our audio tour, um, you can learn all about the surprise painting that we found just a few years ago. There's a lot to learn about the mission and I as a mother and as a female steward leader, want to make sure that you feel welcome and included when you come. Our staff is really ready to welcome you here at the mission. And some things you can do to prepare for your visit is one, make sure you wear a mask right now. I'm gonna put mine back on because we do not want to be shut down. We've been shut down twice and we're in the red tier right now. We want to stay in the red and get into orange. So if you do plan to visit, bring your mask, wear it properly. Please don't be mean to our team because uh, that's no fun. When you come, take the audio tour. We have it in five languages. So if you're a student studying a second language or you are born and raised and you're, you speak multiple languages, enjoy our audio tour. Let me know what you think. We also have a really fun sticker tour for kids, but a lot of young people and older people like it. And you can just take this sticker set and you walk around and you look for a cross and you look for a basket and you put the stickers on the map and that's kind of a fun little thing to do. You can also plan ahead to stay. You can go to our new hotel. We have three in town. We have a bunch of cool restaurants. Go to our website, missionsjc.com, and you can see how to plan your visit. And if you're a member, you can come in for the whole year for free. If you're not a member, that's okay. We'd love to have you. We have a special pricing for 4 for 45. And if you want to volunteer, we'd love to have you. I just want to tell you how grateful I am on this beautiful St. Joseph's Day a very different one for us, virtual with a little bit of live stuff that you've tuned in, that you chose to join me for this last hour. And I hope that I get to meet you one day personally here on the grounds. What we say here on the mission is vaya con Dios. And what that means is go with God, regardless of who you are and where you are. I wish you Godspeed, vaya con Dios. Toby on Facebook says, we are doing such an amazing job with the preservation. Okay, so they thank you for that. Toby, thank you so much. You know, I appreciate the compliments, but I would tell you that the community really has risen to the challenge. And I'll say a couple personal things. One, I walk the grounds every day. When I walk the grounds, the guests come from everywhere and they have all kinds of issues and excitement and the kids and there's different walks of life. And I know the old places have a power and purpose to inspire. And you don't have to be Catholic or you don't have to be Californian or Orange County to appreciate that places like this can bring people closer. And I think in a pandemic right now, we're all just seeing a little hope, something about the beauty of the grounds and the preservation and care and stewardship of the decaying buildings juxtaposes to inspire something in our hearts. And I think that that's magical. And I thank yeah. you for even understanding that we're working hard to preserve things. Jose DeSanta so, says he wishes he was there today to celebrate his birthday. Happy birthday, Jose. You know, is your name Joe? Jose? Happy Burger. birthday. And it's your St. Joseph, so you get to celebrate your birthday every day for a whole year. And let's see. Uh, thank you so much for telling us this beautiful history of the mission. Well, I look forward to doing this again, everybody. I've never done this, and I thought my virtual guides are doing this. We're going to see 28,000 fourth graders this year on virtual tours. And they look really good, these hardworking guest services staff. I thought I need to go out there and do it myself just so I have an understanding of what it feels like. I noticed there's a lot of interruptions. There's some birds that are flying around. I wish they were the swallows, but they're over at the creek. And uh, it's a lot of fun. And so I think having, knowing that you're out there and that you care just makes us all want to do a better job. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye, Dios.